thanks, Zoe, and thank you, Turner Pope, for having us this evening. It's great to be here and get the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. Apologies from Dan Betts, who was unable to make it our CEO, but hopefully I'll do a good job of covering for him this evening. I've been with Hummingbird for a little over a decade now. So originally I cut my teeth in Liberia, where I lived and worked for about two and a half years on our Digby project. And then for the last eight years or so, I've been working alongside Dan, uh, based out of London, but obviously in and out of Africa pretty regularly. As Zoe said, Hummingbird is an African gold producer listed on AIM. We have one mine in Mali, and we have one significant development project in Liberia. We built the project, as Zoe said, successfully through 2017. Last year was our first full year of commercial production, uh, and obviously have moved ahead this year with, with a stronger set of results moving through. I think importantly, we've got a very large set of exploration assets as well, and obviously the Liberian project, uh, and both countries are very favorable for the mining industry, so pleased with the location we're in and pleased with the progress we've made. I think Hummingbird's fairly unique in that we've gone from being a private explorer right through to being a listed producer. Most people in our industry either remain explorers or are developers or are producers, and I think we've taken a grassroots project in Liberia with zero discovery through to a development stage asset, uh, and we've made acquisitions in the form of Yam Falila, and we've then taken that into production. So I think we've been fairly unique in the market in, in moving over the course of a decade through from being an explorer into being a producer. Uh, I think as a team, we've shown the ability to both do deals which have been value accretive. For example, we bought Yam Falila for around $20 million uh, in stock. Next year, we're forecast to do around 130,000 ounces at perhaps $850 an ounce. So hopefully you can see the EBITDA generation there and the impact that investment had to, to move Yam Falila into production. Uh, I think we've also recently brought online a second ball mill, for example, which was another project we did on time and on budget. So I think Hummingbird's shown uh, we're a good platform to grow from. And whilst, as I'll go into in a minute, we had some operational challenges for part of last year, I think we've come strongly through those and we've built stronger as a team from it. So yeah, looking into, I guess, the 2019 performance, I think some of you will be familiar with the story. So I think it's probably worth touching on 2018 as well, just to, to bring you up to see where we're at. Uh, we produced first gold in December 2017. And the first half of 2018, Hummingbird had a really successful year where we ramped up to commercial production in Q1. And Q2, we had a very successful 33,000 ounces of production at, at a sub $800 fall in sustaining cost. I think it's fair to say the second half of 2018 didn't go to plan as we had hoped. I think we got hit on multiple fronts with operational challenges consistently, um, which all came together to give us a pretty tough set um, of numbers at the end of the year, which you know, ultimately, uh, I guess, led to a weakness in our share price, which you probably have been able to witness. Some of those lagged on into Q1 this year, but I think what we've seen since Q1 is a, a steadying strengthening um, of operations. We've, we've gone quarter on quarter, increased production, and quarter on quarter, reduced costs. So we're very pleased with, I think, how we've overcome the trouble we had at the end of last year and the start of this year. And I think looking forward to the rest of this year and into next year, we, we've recently commissioned a second ball mill on our processing plant, which ultimately has the impact of, of increasing production by up to around 20, 25%. So I think seeing those numbers coming through over the course of the rest of this year and next year is pretty exciting. I think the other thing which is, is just worth mentioning briefly now is also is the balance sheet. I think you know when we started production, we had a little over $60 million of debt. And at the start of this year, it was still at around $50 million. Ultimately, I guess the repayment of our debt slowed slightly towards the end of the last year. But if you look forward from now for the next nine months, we look to go from being net debt to net cash which I think will be a significant transformation for the company's balance sheet and will be looked to be zero debt by Q2 2021. So I think the progression of Hummingbird from being a development company, building a mine, to being a company in positive cash flow with you know, net cash and then zero debt in a very short space of time, I think will be transformational for the business. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's going to be hopefully a pretty quick path to, so I guess, moving the narrative from I guess a struggling operation towards the end of last year to hopefully one that's in full flow very successfully. They always say a picture says a thousand words. So I'm gonna show you a short video, uh, hopefully if it starts.
Don't blame me for the soundtrack. Um, like it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing building a gold mine, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's been an amazing journey for me and for, for Hummingbird, and I think it's really hard standing in a room just talking to some slides going, here's the production number, it's up 1,000, here's the cost number, it's down 10 bucks. But you know, in reality, you've got 20, 100-ton trucks driving around, you've got five excavators, you've got an operation that's going 24 hours a day every single day of the year, not a single day off, not a single shift off. And it's a pretty cool achievement, and I think um, you can sometimes lose it in an RNS, and you're just putting a number out there, and you're just putting out a narrative. So I think it is, it is good, hopefully, to see a video and to see that it's real and to see that we're doing. And I think it is, you know, it's been transformational for that region. We, we employ around 1,000 people, directly and indirectly. 96% of those are Marleyans, uh, which I think is a testament to, to Hummingbird and what we've done on the ground. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been an exciting journey. Just moving on a bit, I think one aspect of Hummingbird we probably talked about a bit, we probably haven't explained well enough to the market is, um, you know, and it's a weakness for us, but for me, I see it as one of our biggest strengths is that we've got a relatively short mine life. As it stands, our reserve mine life, which is you, essentially you mine a reserve and you discover a resource. So our reserve mine life is taking us to about 2025 but we've got a million ounces of resources outside of reserve. So the challenge for Hummingbird is to convert those resources into reserves and increase that mine life. Um, as, it stand, as it stood, sorry, historically, we've converted at about a 55% conversion rate. So it doesn't take a mathematical genius to see that, you know, we firmly believe there's, you know, mine life to take us to 2030 and beyond, which I think when you see those numbers come through, hopefully over the next 12 to 18 months as we do exploration work and bring those numbers into reserves, that will have a material impact on the project's NPV. Just dipping into it, where are we going to add those reserves? Um, one area is a deposit called Gonka. Gonka's not currently got any reserves at all, so it's got around 300 to 400,000 ounces of resources. It's five kilometers from the process plant, so extremely close. There are aspects, there are parts of our open pit which are probably four or five kilometers from the process plant, so it's, it's right on it. Uh, and it has, importantly, an underground resource of around four and a half grams a ton. So to put that in perspective, it's 50% higher grade than our current open pit reserve. So obviously the impact of bringing in a 50% better grade whilst maintaining the same throughput will obviously have a positive impact on production. Um, so I think the challenge for most mines is as you go through the mine life, generally your reserve grade reduces and ultimately you know, your costs go up and your production goes down. I think one thing Hummingbird has the ability to do and we need to just prove it and bring it into reserve is to bring in higher grade ore later in the mine life to at least maintain, if not hopefully improve slightly, our reserve grade through the life of mine. So I believe from 2025 onwards, Hummingbird will continue to be poor in gold and delivering some strong economics. But ultimately, that's a, a weakness to a degree because the reserve life is perceived to be short. But for me, it's a strength if you can buy into and believe that our resources have been converting historically, historically pretty well. Liberia, Dugby. Uh, it's a camp I lived at for two years of my life. It was certainly a period where I was single most of the time. Uh, and I guess, more excitingly, it was actually a period of massive discovery. Um, I think at the time from 2010 through to 2012, Hummingbird had the fastest growing resource base in Africa. We went from zero ounces to four million ounces in the ground, all discovered, all a virgin discovery with the drill bit um, over the course of two and a half years. So it was a fantastically exciting time for the company. Um, ultimately, the company in 2014 bought Jan Falila, and we've spent the last four to five years developing and building that project. So Liberia's um, sat there slightly like the little brother, not being looked after enough. But I think we have taken good strides with the, comp with the project. We had it permitted earlier this year. So in Q2 this year, we got our MDA, which is your mineral development agreement, which gives you the 25-year security of tenure. So that's extremely important. And I think the project itself um, is a lower grade than the Amphalila. So ultimately, it's a, it's a slightly lower margin project. But ultimately, with a, with a rise in gold price, you've got you know, very good leverage into it. So it's give or take a $900 an ounce project, um, but obviously with a gold price moving up through $1,500, um, you know, that MPV at $1,500 an ounce goes from $190 million to over $250 million. So it's a project which, as we have more time, um, ultimately we're in a steady state of operations now at Yanfalila. We're able to turn more attention to this, and I think there's good value to be had from this project, and I think the market perception is that we've left it there and we're not interested in it, which is far from the truth. It's just a case of we've been fully focused on our revenue generating asset and ultimately that has suffered from, the, from, the, from that, but it doesn't mean that it's not a good asset. We, we think it's very strong. How am I doing on time, Zoe? I don't want to delay the drinks break. 
Yeah, so capital stru structure, I think Zoe touched on it a little bit. I think, importantly, um, we're going through this transition phase. I think, you know, we started up well, we had a bit of a hiccup, and now we're coming back to a much stronger revenue generation. So I think our transition from net debt to net cash um, over the course of the next nine months, I think, will be hopefully seen very positively by the sector. Uh, and I think, you know, our debt going to zero by June 2021 will also be significant. If you look at our shareholders, I think important to note on that share register is that when we funded the mine at 22p, uh, we did that obviously raising about $70 million of equity. The only group on that register who actually participated in that was, well, one, the management, and secondly, OD Asset Management. All of the rest of those investors have bought shares in the market. So I think what you've seen is um, good, strong institutions who have been buying in the market and buying into the company. So I think hopefully that's a testament to people buying into Hummingbird. Uh, we're completely unhedged. So um, all of our gold, we're selling it you know, once to twice, um, once a week to twice a, to, to a fortnight. And you know, you're realizing the spot gold price every time you sell it. So I think hopefully we've attracted some really strong investors over the course of the last two years. And hopefully they're buying into the future of Hummingbird that, that we see as well. Yeah, here's a quick comp chart. I don't really want to dwell on it because I think it's probably terrible when someone comes here and tells you they're, they're very cheap. But um, our broker did give us that chart, so I thought it was worthwhile putting it in there. Apparently, apparently we're undervalued. So look, in summary, um, Hummingbird is a, a West African gold company. We've got a producing mine. It's been steadily increasing production. Looking forward to next year, uh, we believe we should be doing around 130,000 ounces of gold production. And I'd like to think our cost base will be around $850 an ounce. So depending on what gold price you want to use, you use $1,400, maybe it's $70 million of EBITDA. You use $1,500, maybe it's $85 million of EBITDA. I think you're seeing a company that's in a quite a transformational stage where it's gone from some operational hiccups, as I've mentioned, um, through to now four or five months of solid um, production. And I think you know, hopefully in our Q3 and then in our Q4, you will see a stronger set of results than we've been delivering so far since the mine's been in operation. So obviously looking forward to delivering those to the market and continually um, updating everyone. What have I missed? No, I think that's it. Thank you, Bert. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the mine is currently 85% owned by Hummingbird. Who owns the other 15%? Uh, so it's 90% uh, it's owned by Hummingbird. Um, so the government of Mali has a 10% free carried interest in the mine. They have taken up their right to buy an additional 10%, which would take them to 20% and we would own 80. Um, but they need to pay us $10 million before they get that 10%. So currently they have a free carried interest of 10% on the mine. Um, and ultimately the next 10%, um, they need to pay $10 million before they get it, which is their right to do. I think it's worth noting that that additional 10% would not have a preferred dividend. So currently the company has around $100 million of intercompany loans, which we will be recouping to ourselves before any dividend is paid to other shareholders. And what is in the other liabilities? You have $15 million of other liabilities on your balance sheet. Uh, the $15 million, oh, that is, so on our, I believe what you're talking about is our royal, we have a royalty on the project in Liberia um, to Anglo-Pacific, but until it doesn't transfer to being a royalty until we move the project forward. So it sits there as a, as a liability until it moves further forward. So I believe that's the Anglo-Pacific royalty, on the, specifically on the Liberian project, which is a 2% um, net smelters royalty. And how much capex do you expect for the next two years? And could you start paying dividend already from this year, or is this too early? Uh, the first bit on the capex, ultimately the ball mill was our big capex item. It cost around $30 million to put in the ball mill but we're getting 20% better throughput, so that's, uh, that's a positive investment. Going forward, the big sustaining CapEx item really is your tailings facility, so your TSF, which obviously houses your tailings. Ultimately, every 18 months to two years, we need to do a tailings lift, and they generally cost around two to $3 million. So in terms of sustaining CapEx, you're looking at ultimately, say, three to $4 million a year um, you know, for a sustaining CapEx item. So your second part of your question, could we pay a dividend? I think we've been focused on getting operations working and singing. And I think obviously by the middle of next year, when you're hopefully 
net cash, I certainly think then the company will be looking at it. We've always said that we would look to pay dividends as soon as we feel we're able to, but I think you need to have probably a slightly stronger balance sheet than we have right now, which I think the next six months will, will deliver. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. The sustainable capex per year would be then? Call it through about $3 million. $3 million. Yeah. For your existing, up, for the, the um, surface operation? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's very low. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very strong, attractive uh, story. Can I ask a question about your environmental promise, uh, policies? Because yep. obviously that sort of mining has a big impact on the environment. What, yep. what are your policies relating to that? I mean, we follow the equator principles, um, and obviously we have all of the environmental permits we need to, and obviously follow best practice. Uh, I guess getting into more detail, I suppose, ultimately all mining operations have an impact on the environment. There's no point hiding that. We're digging a big hole in the ground and, and taking out gold. I think, as you know, gold is a precious metal. The length of our two current open pits is about one and a half to two kilometers long, um, and they will go to around 150 meters in depth. Um, so I think the actual impact, you know, an iron ore project, you're basically potentially taking off a whole mountain. You know, ultimately, it's, they're relatively small open pits, and, I'll, and they will then become lakes. They will naturally fill with water. The water table sits. 25 meters below the surface. So they will ultimately become a lake in time. Um, but yes, look, we follow all best practice. Uh, we have a technical advisory committee and we also have an ESG committee, uh, which is, I think, you know, very strong. A lady called Kate Harkel, who's, who's on the committee um, and others. So I think it's something we do take um, very seriously as we have to and, and is, is very important. But I don't know any other specific details you want on it. Or. What would you say the risks are for mining regime change in uh, Mali? Sorry? What would you say are the risks of a mining regime change in uh, Mali? Yeah, so there's been some recent press about um, updating the mining code in Mali, which I think had a fair amount of press. Ultimately, they have three different mining codes currently, I believe, in practice. Uh, the code humming that is under is the 2012 code, which is a 30% corporation tax rate and a 3% royalty rate. Uh, some of the other codes, I believe, have a 5% royalty rate. As it stands, for our existing mine life, there will be no change to our, the mining code we're under. So for the next six, five years, six years, there will be no change to the current code, so our tax stability is in place. There is the chance that at the end of the 20, at the end 2025, we would come under a new unified code, which could change the tax um, implications for us. But... I don't think Yampalil will be made or broken by a move from sort of 3% to 5% royalty or not, I hope. But yeah, there is obviously the chance that the tax rate we're under could increase slightly because we're currently under the most favorable code and they're looking to unify the codes under one tax regime, essentially. Um, I've got three uh, question areas. Right. Uh, your production problems last year, yes. which were weather-related and a collapsing wall on the side of the pit. Yeah. Just, uh, to, just to clarify, it was a potential collapse. It didn't actually collapse. So there was a crack developed 70 meters back from the pit wall. And for safety reasons, we mitigated the crack by doing a cutback. And I think you know, it was a perception issue. As soon as you announced that you'd done a cutback for a crack, everyone's assumed you've had a massive pit failure. But incidentally, it was actually a superficial crack, unfortunately for us. But once you've announced it, you've lost the narrative. So that was uh, our, our loss, sadly. And you lost a lot of production. It cost a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. So how can you reassure us that that is not going to happen again? That's the first question. Um, second one was the country is beset with security issues. Yep. Um, I, you know, they've been going on for years and years and years. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and yep. where you sit within the country and have you had any problems and so on? And the third issue is uh, labor issues. Have you had any labor issues? Yep. Is your labor force unionized? Yep. Okay. Are they, you know, yep. Cooperation. No problem, yeah. The first one, obviously, categorically, I can't say no, we'll never have another issue again. That is the risk of investing in a West African gold mining company that's going to throw off, hopefully, $80 million of EBITDA off a $110 million market cap next year. Um, I think, importantly, about last year, our, our open pits go to about 50 meters of oxidization, so essentially a free digging material. And then from 50 meters of depth, you, you transition into more of a fresh rock, essentially a hard rock. So last year, we were hit on all fronts in the sense that we had the wettest wet season in whatever it was, 30 years. And we were still only at about 30 to 40 meters depth. So we were still in this essentially like oxide, basically mud. 
the benefit of where we are now is we're well into the fresh rock. So obviously you've got much greater stability and the risk of having another issue like last year is massively mitigated against. I think secondly, the other factor of it is, is ultimately last year was our first year of operation. So um, you're always more prepared the more experienced you are. You understand the ore bodies, you understand the operations better. So I think unfortunately we had an absolutely terrible wet season in our very first year of operations. But fundamentally, the big issue for me was we are still in the oxides, which are obviously cheap and easier to mine, but the downside is there's less stability. So in extremely bad, unseasonally wet, wet weather, um, it, it harmed us. The second question was about Mali. Um, look, it's not a classic tourist destination. Uh, so I think you've got to understand where you're going to. Uh, it's an absolutely enormous country. So we are in the southwest of it on the border with Guinea, which is... Um, Better, better crack on, um, which is uh, the best part to be in. It's, yeah, when you land in Bamako, you don't go north. If you go north, there is significant issues in the country and no one is advised to go there. If you go south, um, it has been relatively safe and peaceful. There have been the odd instances of carjackings and other things, um, but ultimately it's, um, you know, it has been okay. I think it's worth noting, Mali's had a commercial gold mining industry for about 30 years now. And as far as I'm aware, no gold mine has been interrupted by political instability or you know, threats of terrorism or other such like. So yes, we're not dealing with Nevada, sadly, but um, ultimately it's its second biggest industry, the gold mining industry. So the government has a massive vested interest in making sure that the gold mines continue, op continue to operate. And you know, to date they have done. I mean, look, we travel there at the mine opening, Dan, the CEO, took his mother um, so, I mean, if he was seriously worried about that, you probably wouldn't take your mother to the mine opening. So, I think, look, we, um, we, operate, um, we operate there, but we're very mindful of the situation. And, yes, Mali is a unionized country, so there are unions there. Um, to date, we haven't had um, any issues with it, but ultimately, like every union, it's going to have an impact on costs. So, if you look back to our feasibility study, as some of you may have read, um, we had forecast around a $700 an ounce all-in sustaining cost of production. And that was obviously published about three or four years ago. We're now looking at more of a long time cost target of around $850 an ounce. A combination of factors. Um, at the time, for every dollar on the fuel price, add about a dollar to our all in sustaining cost. And ultimately, the cost of labor. We have 1,000 employees. And you know, unionization obviously does lead to wage inflation. And ultimately, that rise from sort of 700 to 850 is, is a whole host of factors, partly security partly labor costs, partly fuel costs increasing over that time. So um, there are unions. We haven't had any strikes. We haven't lost any production for union issues. And I would like to say, touch wood, we've got an extremely low turnover rate. So I think people expect to have about a 30% turnover rate um, on a mine site. And we've been averaging about a 15% turnover rate. Admittedly, it's, it's early days, but we, we've had a low turnover of stuff. Thank you. Um, Liberia. New country, when do you expect to start producing there? What is the estimated capex? And yep. how do you feel on, on the political risk? Um, all I heard was bad things about Liberia. So, and is this a surface mine again or yeah, uh, underground? Open. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so Liberia at the moment, we haven't got a stated timeline of when it would move into production. As it stands, we've got a PEA or scoping study delivered on the project. And we were partially through completing a feasibility study when we bought Jan Falila. So we will need to go back and complete a feasibility study, and then we would need to then obviously move into construction. So in reality, you're probably talking with the best will in the world 12 months to complete a feasibility study, and then you're talking probably 18 to 24 months to build a mine of the scale um, Digby would need to be. It is an open pit mine. It's got a low strip ratio. It's got good metallurgical recoveries. But in reality, the capex is bigger. It would be a north of $200 million capex mine. Um, in terms of the politics and the country, again, it's not a classic tourist destination, although I have taken my wife. Um, it's, it's a beautiful country in many ways. It's got amazing beaches, beautiful jungle, but you know, it's had a turbulent history. It's probably best known for you know, Charles Taylor and Blood Diamond, sadly, sadly but that was 20 plus years ago. So yeah, it's, got, it's got an emerging economy, I guess. It's got some growing industries, but it's not, um, I guess, a developed country as you might see it. So it has operational challenges you, you've got to get through. And the 200 million would be funded by whom? Or what, how, how do you plan to fund that expense, or capex, I should say? Look, I think that's a question for 
I guess, the board and speaking with our shareholders, I think, in my mind, you've got a, a mine that's delivering pretty high margin production. And then in Liberia, you've got a lower margin mine. I'm not sure our shareholders would bite our arm off if we put all of our free cash flow into a lower margin project. I think traditionally a mine of that style is probably suited to a bigger company to build than a company like Hummingbird. It's probably better to be built six, seven million tons a year and, and crank it up and build it bigger. Um, so I think there's lots of options of, of how we develop Liberia. Um, but I think we certainly aren't saying we're going to put the next five years free cash into building Liberia into a lower margin project. I think we need to assess the economics. We need to complete the study and we need to look at the options. But I think it wouldn't be surprise me if there were partners who came in who the mine was more suited to them developing, which might offer our shareholders a better return. Please show your appreciation for Bert and Hummingbird. <laughs>